Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, best wishes from Yashoda Hospital. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, today, the topic we are going to discuss <coughs> is the role of third empires in the management of coronary artery disease, the decision makers with FFR, IVUS, and optical coherence tomography. I would like to start my presentation with this video clip of a 1992 cricket match where Sachin Tendulkar was in the crease playing a shot and just have a look at this. He played a shot. Watch. He wants the opinion of a third empire. With a monitor, a television monitor, and anxiously the players waited for the decision as to whether. For the first time in the history of cricket in the year 1992, Who else? a third empire's opinion was taken, which was a television monitor. Andrew Hudson for the stumps, and the television replay and the slow motion clearly showing that the talker. Chandulkar was declared out by this technology usage of a television monitor in the umpire's room, wherein nineteen ninety two this happened. It A beautiful slide here telling you that sometimes the umpire is not able to make a decision. Sometimes the clinician, the cardiologist is not able to make a decision. There are traditional methods of assessing coronary artery disease, but definitely with the advancement of technology, newer technologies are available today for a very accurate assessment of the coronary artery disease. It is so very necessary to take the aid of this technology that is the third empire what we are going to talk today. This is very important because we have to ensure in today's evidence-based medical practice, scientific data backed up clinical practice, no site should suffer because of a judgmental error. There are multiple situations today we have wherein an angiography is done for coronary artery disease and a clinician says the patient has a triple vessel disease, I will send him for a bypass surgery. The same angiogram in the hands of another cardiologist would be said as a two vessel disease and I would do a angioplasty. So the decision is different, though both are meant for revascularizing the patient and giving him a good long term outcome. However, there could be some unnecessary procedures which could have happened because of these judgments which are taken by the clinicians. Do we have a role? Do we have a, a technology which can be far better than just angiography and anatomy today in making decisions for our patients? So in the risk stratification in coronary artery disease patients, the traditional method was doing an angiogram, assessing the lesion by the angiogram, and taking a decision for revascularization or a medical management, revascularization in the form of a bypass surgery or a angioplasty and stenting. And of course, the gold standard medical management to continue for a lifetime. That being the traditional method of just being angiography, today we have technology which can not only assess the anatomy, but we can also look at the physiology, the physiology of the, the 
coronary stenosis and assess whether that particular stenosis is significant for that particular patient or not. So it's just not enough to do an anatomy. One need to assess the physiology also to assess the coronary artery disease. In clinical practice, the severity of coronary artery disease is usually assessed by invasive angiography, which has several limitations. The interpretation of angiography with eyeballing suffers from a high inter and intra observer variability. Even if angiographic stenosis is accurately assessed, it does not always correlate with functional significance of a given, of a given lesion. And thus, the functional evaluation of coronary artery disease is becoming more and more important. And this can be achieved with echocardiography, stress nuclear scan images, magnetic resonance imaging to the tune of about 70 to 90%. The courage substudy demonstrated that a benefit of revascularization is present in patients who have more than 10% myocardial ischemic burden as determined by the nuclear stress testing. Therefore, the benefit of PCI was not seen in the absence of a severe stenosis or severe ischemia. And non-invasive testing again has limitations, in particular in patients with multivessel disease and left main coronary artery disease. Therefore, today we have a newer technology where we can do a invasive functional testing. And this has emerged as a main strategy to overcome the limitations of anatomic assessment, non-invasive imaging to guide our patients to a better long-term outcomes. Several techniques have been done. One of them being fractional flow reserve. We are going to see them in the next few slides. Today we have a computerized tomography derived FFR also coming into the, as an emerging technique for non-invasive functional assessment. Let's look at the example of this 58 year old male who was recently referred to us with a new onset effort intolerance. His angiogram revealed a triple vessel disease and in the periphery at another hospital, he was advised a bypass surgery. He presented to us with effort intolerance and a triple vessel disease uh, going, for, going for a bypass surgery. And if you look at this angiogram, the right coronary artery has in the distal vessel a significant 60%, 70% stenosis there. And his, he was taken up for an angioplasty. However, we felt we should do a fractional flow reserve, which is just a wire which is going into the coronary artery and assessing the pressure drop in the coronary artery with a hyperemia being induced with IV intravenous adenosine. Here you see a left anterior descending artery having a significant stenosis again to the tune of about 60 to 70 percent, an intermediate lesion in the LAD and the a, quite a significant lesion in the proximal circumflex leading to the op major obtuse marginal. So by definition, this patient has a triple vessel disease, 60 to 70 percent lesion in right coronary artery, 70 percent to 80 percent lesion in circumflex and LAD. And what happened? When we did an FFR for all the three vessels, we had a values of 0 0.84, 0 0.87, and 0 0.85, telling us that this patient can be equally well managed with medical management, optimal medical therapy with good dose of statins, antiplatelet agents, ACE inhibitors, and beta blockers to give him an optimal result for a long term, too. PCI, angioplasty was deferred. Surgery was deferred and he went home happily with a decision for a medical management. Was this a right decision? We are backed up with enough scientific data today. Lots of times we see patients having a triple vessel disease or a two vessel disease, but this not, does not always equal to a physiological three vessel disease or a two vessel disease. Anatomically, you may see a three vessel disease, but physiologically that three vessel disease may become a two vessel disease if you demonstrate with an FFR, or it may become a three vessel disease, may become a single vessel disease, and rarely a three vessel disease, like in our case example, will become a zero vessel disease. There is an atherosclerotic plaque, but it does not need a surgical or a percutaneous angioplasty intervention because medical management is as good as surgical or angioplasty. They were we are backed up by three landmark trials, the DIFFER study, the FAME study, and the FAME2 study. 
there are studies to determine the appropriateness of the PTCA in moderate coronary stenosis, like in our case. And we have 15 years data to tell us that when we have a, a good result with FFR, the long-term results are quite good with revascularization and without revascularization. So one could postpone the, the revascularization. So there is a definite role of this invasive functional assessment of a coronary lesion, which is documented by angiography. And before study, both the five years and 15 years have clearly shown that with an intermediate coronary stenosis and an FFR value of more than 0 0.75, the risk of cardiac death or myocardial infarction related to this stenosis is less than 1% per year and not decreased by stenting, which is as good as for the general population. Let's look at another study there, the FAME study. The FAME study studied whether one should do an intervention based on angiography or based on FFR. Routine measurement of FFR in patients with multi-vessel coronary artery disease who are undergoing PTCA with drug eluting stents significantly reduces the rate of composite endpoint of death, myocardial infarction, and repeat revascularization at one year. There were less number of stents used, less procedures in patients who were guided by FFR. So a physiological assessment before the procedure in the catheterization laboratory is a very good way of assessing for that particular vessel, for that particular stenosis, whether it is that stenosis severity is good enough to do a intervention. So an FFR guided PCI versus a medical therapy using individual patient data, there was a 28% reduction in the composite endpoint of death, MI, which was observed with FFR guided PCI compared with medical therapy. So definitely we have a new technology which is available today, which is telling us that either to go ahead with an intervention with angioplasty surgery or continue the patient for a long-term medical therapy. Let's look at this patient who was a 62 year old female patient who had symptoms of angina, but angiogram was borderline. There is a lesion in the proximal LAD, which is about less than 50%, we thought. And we did a FFR to this vessel, and the FFR was found to be 0 0.67. Anything, any value less than 0 0.75 is telling you that this is a significant vessel with a significant uh, stenosis leading to an ischemia. The vessel was stented, and the FFR post post stenting, the FFR value was 0 0.98. Again, telling us that intermediate 50% stenosis was proved to be intermediate and by FFR to be a quite a significant lesion necessitating an intervention. Again, the DIFFER study demonstrated in the very long term, 15 years safety and efficacy of differing a PCI if the FFR value is more than 0 0.80, a definite scientific advancement we have. And this is what is called a fractional flow reserve. It is the ratio of the maximal myocardial flow in the stenotic territory to a maximal myocardial flow in that same territory if the stenosis were absent. So if you, here is a case, patient where we have a right coronary artery having a stenosis there. So we put in a wire into the coronary artery, it's called a pressure wire. It measures the pressure proximal to the stenosis in the iota or at the ostium of the coronary artery. And again, in the distal segment and at the distal point, the pressure sensor is there and that measures the pressure drop between the proximal vessel and the distal vessel. And we look at the baseline flow. Here, the baseline flow is quite matched, but when we give intracoronary adenosine and produce a maximal hyperemia of the distal coronary vascular bed, there is a significant drop in the, in the pressure distal to the stenosis. The blue line having a significant drop in the pressure compared to the red trace what we have, which is in the iota there. So this lesion appears to be quite significant, telling us that he would definitely need an angioplasty for the coronary lesion. This drop in the pressure in the iota and in the distal vessel is a very important point. And with a value more than 0 0.80, one can differ very safely 
a percutaneous coronary intervention, stenting, or a bypass surgery. So this was the deferred study. Is PCI, PCI justified in functionally insignificant lesions? No. There is one need not do. If they have a functionally insignificant lesion, one can defer safely an angioplasty. Both the two-year follow-up, five-year follow-up, and the 15-year follow-up have very clearly shown that the primary endpoint of death, MI, and unplanned hospitalization are almost equal with medical therapy and without uh, intervention there. So also a left main coronary artery, this patient has got a left main coronary artery lesion. How do we manage initially when we had such a stenosis during our uh, olden times, the patient was urgently referred to the surgeon and thereby he would go in for a bypass surgery. Today we have technology where we can assess the left main coronary artery lesion very clearly, both with FFR and with intravascular imaging to know whether one could go with the medical management, one should do a PCI, or one could do a bypass surgery. One could image the left main coronary artery very clearly with an intravascular ultrasound and assess the anatomy inside with a three-dimensional structure and decide the treatment strategy, whether you should go for a bypass surgery, should go for a PTCA, or should go for a medical management if the lesion is not significant. This was a study which was published in the circulation where 274 patients with left main coronary stenosis were followed up. 136 patients included in the analysis, 73 patients were included in the, uh, the surgical group and in the non-surgical group. And what they found, the left main coronary artery assessment by FFR, the five-year outcome, when the FFR value was more than 0 0.80, differing revascularization was as good as medical therapy. And this is the, the cath lab where we do a lot of imaging. One could do an angiography, one could do an intravascular ultrasound, one could do an optimal coherence tomography, one could do a, 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 a NEARS study. Today, we have imaging which can predict the need, which can triage an intervention for a surgery, surgery for a PCI or for a medical management. We can understand the coronary artery disease much more clearly with much more uh, clarity. So therefore imaging does predict, can triage a patient. So it can tell us about the thickness of the fibroethroma. Is it a thin cap fibrous ethroma? Is it a thick cap fibrous ethroma? Uh, here is a patient who has undergone a CT coronary angiogram for the LAD, L6, and RCA in the top row. And if you look at the lesion, the original angiogram, the, the LAD lesion, there is a definitely a soft plaque. And the white arrow, what you have seen there, there's a soft eccentric plaque, white plaque. So the CT angiogram is one technology wherein one could study the plaque in the vessel wall and predict the events. A soft plaque is much more dangerous than a calcified plaque. It, it could be having a large lipid core, a large lipid necrotic core, which could lead to a plaque rupture and lead to a acute coronary syndrome. And this, this same patient had a, six months later had an acute coronary syndrome, clearly showing a very clear critical stenosis in the diagram C here, very critical stenosis in the LAD, and that needed to be stented there. So one can assess with our imaging technology today, which plaque is vulnerable, which plaque is vulnerable for rupture, which plaque is potentially dangerous for a particular individual. So if you look at this CT angiogram picture telling you that this patient is having an unstable angina in the non-culprit artery, but has, is having a stenosis in the coronary artery, as well as there is a <coughs> positive vessel remodeling, there is a significant soft plaque, there is a fibrous plaque, and there is some amount of calcification. So a, a coronary vessel can be very well assessed with CT angiography to tell us what is happening to the remodeling, the soft plaque, the fibrous plaque, and the calcification. And the same thing can be assessed through intravascular ultrasound as well as with optical coherence tomography. Let's look at this slide. Pre-statin, pre-diet, and pre-statin. You look at this optical coherence tomography images. Statins stabilize the plaque and increase the thickness of the fibrous plaque and decrease the volume of the necrotic fatty plaque. They have definite role in stabilizing the 
plaque vulnerability. So a thick fibrous cap is what is desirable. Any plaque which is more than 70 microns is quite safe. Look at this angiography there. If you look at the proximal circumflex, it has got a mild plaque. If you look at the angiographic picture, the red arrow and the yellow arrow, and the same when we do an intravascular ultrasound, you see a quite a significant plaque, eccentric plaque in the circumflex, almost to the tune of 50% there. And when you come back at this particular point, yellow, yellow arrow, you see almost a 70 to 80% luminal narrowing, significant fibrotic plaque in the lumen there. What you assess by angiography is probably mild, but what you see with intravascular ultrasound is a quite a significant stenosis there. So a normal IVUS gets, gives you a histopathological picture of the adventitia, the external elastic lamina, the media, the internal elastic lamina, and the, the intima, and the intimal plaque there. A very beautiful picture we can get uh, procured with an intravascular ultrasound there. One could study the plaque extent, one could study the plaque morphology, a fibrous plaque or a fibrofatty plaque or a soft plaque with a large lipid necrotic core. The plaque composition can be studied, the distribution of the plaque can be studied, and I was extends our capability to visualize beyond the lumen, including in the vessel wall, and assess the characteristics of the vessel wall. An angiogram, the conventional angiogram, is a luminogram. It only talks, tells you about the lumen. Whereas an intravascular ultrasound or an OCT will not only tell you about the lumen, but also will tell you the structure of the vessel wall, the components of the vessel wall, where atherosclerosis is to begin. Sometimes we do visualize small dissections, erosions in the plaque after angioplasty. So if you do an intravascular ultrasound, it definitely improves the outcomes. It provides a tomographic images allowing the measurement of the vessel and thereby the stent size, the plaque size, the plaque volume, the plaque burden. IVUS is helpful in planning and execution of PCI. Stent expansion and opposition can be assessed by IVUS. Of course, IVUS is not a tool for the assessment of lesions, hemodynamic severity. It's only an anatomical image. It does not assess the physiology. For physiology, you may have to go back to the FFR. IVUS is very helpful in understanding the mechanisms of restenosis there. So one could do a vessel size, one could assess the, you look at the images here, the proximal reference, the distal reference, and the significant plug burden what you have in the segment there. One could assess the calcification, moderate calcification, eccentric calcification, almost a 360 degree calcification, telling you significant calcification, which also tells you what is the, how well the stent has been deployed. If you look at this picture here, there's a critical stenosis in this particular vessel there, post bypass surgery, the vessel was stented and we were quite happy with the post stenting result angiographically. But when we did an angiography, you've very clearly seen that the stent is under expanded there. The stent is under expanded, though you angiographically, you have seen a very good result there. So there comes the role of this third empire, intravascular ultrasound. What is angiographically good is a very suboptimal result when you do an intravascular ultrasound, thereby telling us to optimize this result, probably one would use a hypersia balloon or a larger size balloon to deploy the stent adequately so that you have a very good long-term outcomes. So not, not only the stent expansion, but also you can study by the imaging technologies we have today, a ruptured cap, a thin cap which is ruptured, which can lead to an acute coronary syndrome. One could assess an erosion in the endothelium there. One could assess the degree of calcium here in the OCT image, you're seeing a white thrombus, which is present here in the, uh, in the with the plaque erosion, which can lead to an acute coronary syndrome there. Again, in the OCT, you can see a calcific nodule, a calcific nodule, which could having at this edge, a thin cap fibrous, and which could lead to a plaque rupture due to a shear stress in the vessel wall. So how did optical coherence tomography change my practice? This imaging the intracoronary calcium. Now the calcium, earlier days, any patient who has a severe triple vessel disease, significant calcium used to be sent for a bypass surgery. We never had a tool to assess the calcium severity by angiography. It is not a good tool to assess the calcium severity. And almost all the patients who had a severely calcified triple vessel disease used to go for a bypass surgery. Today we have a tool where we can assess the calcium very well and we can 
understand the the distribution of calcium and thereby decide the strategy of stenting with or without a plaque modification with rotablation or a scoring balloon a cutting balloon or a or a intravascular lithotripsy if you look at this chart here the diagnostic accuracy of angiogram is quite less with the severe calcium definitely yes but with mild to moderate calcium deep calcium the degree of calcium arc the calcium thickness the longitudinal calcium length angiography is a poor diagnostic tool intravascular ultrasound and oct definitely score above the angiography oct definitely is much more superior to ivers in doing an assessment of the calcium there importance of calcium assessment is very important because we need to decide on the techniques modalities of plaque modification thereby one could decide to give a long term result there if you look at this patient who had an acute coronary syndrome an enstemy he had a triple vessel disease he had a mild lvd dysfunction and a hypotension and if you look at this angiogram he has a significant lesion in the proximal to middle lvd across the diagonal there the patient had a t wave inversion in v2 to v6 and a rise in troponin i and this was the culprit vessel for this particular patient so we did an optical coherence tomography which is nothing but a a assessment of the lumen there with the optical technology wherein we have the images from the intracoronary segment there when could assess the calcium one could assess the lesion morphology the luminal area and the length of the lesion and here you see a 360 degree arc of calcium you could see the cholesterol crystals one could see the luminal area is 1.24 square millimeters which is a very tight stenosis there and one could assess the nodular calcium one could assess the superficial calcium so you have a beautiful tomographic picture of the entire coronary vessel there across the lesion telling us what is the site of the maximal stenosis what is the composition of the plaque is it a necrotic core lipid rich plaque or is it a fibrous plaque is it a calcific plaque dense calcium small calcium superficial calcium deep calcium beautiful images can be acquired and this technology definitely changes your strategies how best to revascularize this patient this patient had a dense 360 degree calcium so we had to do a rotablation we had to burrow through the calcium break the calcium chunks there the proximal led and this lesion was pre dilated with a balloon and subsequently post rota we have we could show very clearly break in the calcium there a significant expansion of the vessel there you could see in the second picture b a significant break in the calcium and there is a dissection flap here beautiful picture so again telling you that and the post rota we could achieve a good strength result there i'm sorry a good result of the the uh, stent very well deployed a very good result post stenting and with the final oct run showing a good flow and no complications no dissections so if you look at the main theme of my presentation it is to tell one that we have technologies to decide as a third empire whether one should err on the side of doing an intervention or or subject the patient to a medical therapy and assess him annually or ever since 6 months one could avoid unnecessary surgical or percutaneous procedures if the physiological studies have shown that medical therapy is as good as the intervention and to optimize the results of pci in the long term outcomes the third empires are ffr ivs and oct when angio is inconclusive for a decision to revascularize the take home message is angiography is a 2d assessment of a three dimensional structure just anatomy as shown by angio is not enough today to revascularize we have to demonstrate ischemia we have to demonstrate the physiology and this is a very important tool ffr is a very important tool to assess which lesion should be revascularized which vessel should be revascularized which vessel can be left for a medical management so a three vessel disease could ultimately become a single vessel disease a two vessel disease could become a single vessel disease or a triple vessel disease like the case which i had shown did not need even a single stent 
the decision for a three vessel or a two vessel disease or a significant single vessel disease may change based on the FFR value. Imaging strategies with IVUS and OCT are definitely helpful in choosing the strategy of revascularization and optimizing the stent result. Thank you for your patient hearing. If there are any questions from the audience, hello, I would be glad to take them. Sir? Yes. Uh, is, it, is it done, sir? Yes, right. my study is done. Thank you. Yes, sir, it's done, sir. Thank you.